All right, so here we go in our second part of the Nature of Molecules and Properties of Water lecture. So last time we were talking about elements and the number of electrons they contain and how that is the important thing to remember or to identify to then determine how elements will actually stick together and bond to form compounds and other substances. So we'll, again, we're going to continue to build on this idea, but remember, electrons and the octet rule determines bonding. Bonding determines larger structures. Larger structures determine living things. So when we look at any kind of chemical reaction in nature, it's the transfer of electrons from one element to another. They're moving around. They're going back and forth. So when an element loses an electron, we say it's been oxidized. When an element gains an electron, we say it's been reduced. I want you guys to ask your chemistry instructors to explain this to you. Why is reduction a gain in an electron? Get the logic behind it, and it'll help you remember oxidation is loss, reduction is gain. Okay, so that's going to be an important thing to remember as we talk about chemical reactions when we're looking at how these things work. All right, so let's go back to our periodic table. C-H-O-N, carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen. Those are the critical ones I want you guys to memorize. Don't forget phosphorus and sulfur as well. But C-H-O-N makes up approximately 96.3% of the body weight of a human being. So those are pretty darn important elements to remember and understand how they work and how they'll stick together to create molecular structures. So when we're looking at these electrons or these elements and two of them stick together, they form a molecule if they are the same. So a group of like atoms or elements, hydrogen, stuck to another hydrogen. We call that a molecule. The term compound refers to when you have different atoms sticking together. So H2O, two hydrogens, one oxygen form water. That's when we say, oh, you have the compound water. Now, a lot of times the terms molecule and compound are interchanged and mixed around, but the basic difference, molecule, it's you're the same, compound, you have different atoms or elements stuck together. Now, one way of them sticking together is through what we call an ionic bond. So you have two atoms or elements. One of them gains an electron and the other loses an electron. That's an ionic bond. So our example here is sodium chloride. Sodium, let's take a look at sodium over here and chlorine right there. So let's go back to that octet rule. Sodium has two electrons in the inner shell right here. Then the second shell of sodium has eight. So two, four, six, eight. But the third shell of sodium has one. It's got one electron right there. So it's got three shells or three orbitals. First orbital, second orbital, third orbital. Third orbital only has one electron. It wants to have a full outer orbital. That's the goal of the octet rule. So sodium could try to find seven more. That'd be pretty tough. Or it could actually get rid of that one. So if it gets rid of the one electron sitting in the third shell, in a sense it collapses that shell and reduces down to two shells. Chlorine. Let's take a look at that guy. Two electrons in the first shell. Two, four, six, eight in the second shell. And then seven in the third shell. So it's saying, okay, I got seven. I want to get one more, one more, one more of these. And what it will do is it grabs one from sodium. So now if it has seven and it's trying to get to eight, it only needs to gain one more. If sodium has one and it's trying to reduce and go down to zero, 
and needs to lose that one. So this causes sodium to give its electron to chloride, chloride, then it becomes chloride, and it causes chlorine to gain that electron and become the chloride ion, and this forms our sodium chloride. So ionic bond is a give and take type of bond. Let me add that in here. So give and take relationship or bond. It doesn't have great bond strength because it's a give and take scenario, but it's enough to hold sodium and chloride together, creating sodium chloride table salt. Think about what happens when you put that in water. Bond breaks, it disassociates, and the sodium and chloride go their different ways because again it's not a really strong strong bond other bonds we will see are going to be sharing bonds these are known as covalent bonds where two elements or two atoms actually share electrons so they overlap they share one two even up to three electrons so in a covalent bond our example up here is hydrogen, and in this hydrogen example, each hydrogen shares one electron with the other, creating a single covalent bond. If you share two electrons, you have a double. If you share three, you have a triple. That's all it is, single, double, triple covalent bonds based on the number of electrons shared with the other element, or atom in this case. Now, these are going to have a lot of strength. Single bonds, double bond, a lot more strength, triple bond, wow, a lot of strength. So when those bonds are broken, there's energy released. This will bring us into the food chapter when we start talking about molecules of life and food and what happens when we eat something and we break the bonds, we're releasing energy. So the stronger the bond, harder it is to break, but when it is broken, the more energy that gets released from breaking or rupturing that bond. So, all right, now a little bit of a twist on the covalent scenario. If the elements share equally, we refer to this as a nonpolar covalent bond. Put down here. All right, so in nonpolar, there's an equal sharing of the electrons in a polar covalent there's a unequal sharing and i'm just going to make up percentages 60 percent 40 percent type of sharing here in our nonpolar covalent we're going to call that a 50 50 type of relationship or sharing it's not the give and take of an ionic when we talk about the uh, there we go when we talk about the uh, polar covalent. Well, what does happen? And the example is water. The oxygen of water grabs the electron from hydrogen a little bit more than the hydrogen grabs the oxygen. So again, it's not an ionic. We're not at that level of completely taking, completely losing, but we're not 50-50. <clears throat> so this polar covalent bond creates a little bit of a kink or I call it a bend or a alteration to the shape of the water molecule and that sets up what we'll call the properties of water. And we'll be getting into these in a little bit so we're going to come back to this. So what we would see if we could zoom in, let me do the magical drawing, if we zoom in to uh, the oxygen and the hydrogen in water because of this kink here this polar covalent nature hydrogens retain a very 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 slight positive charge and oxygen retains a very slight negative charge and that's going to set up our properties of water which we'll be talking about that in just a minute here all right so we have ionic give and take 
100% give, 100% take. Covalent, sharing. Nonpolar is 50-50. Polar, let's call it 60-40 type of sharing. All right, so now as we're looking at chemical reactions, they're constantly forming and breaking chemical bonds. Bonds are coming together, bonds are broken apart. Bonds are coming together, bonds, are, and it's just continuous. This is how pathways work. So a simple pathway we'll be getting into in a couple weeks here, photosynthesis. You got carbon dioxide plus water. Those are what we call the reactants, ingredients. You use light and chlorophyll to rupture those bonds, and then the bonds reform and retach in different combinations and create carbohydrates and then oxygen. So the parallel to think about, if you've ever played with Legos, you build something with Legos, you tear it apart and rebuild something differently. You tear it apart and make something else. Tear it apart and make something else. That's what chemical reactions are, are Legos. You assemble the Legos in certain patterns, you tear them apart, and you reassemble them in a different pattern. It's all using the same basic Legos. That's how chemical reactions really break down to at the very fundamental level is playing with Legos. Don't tell the chemist I said that, but that's one way to easy way to remember it. The reactions are definitely influenced by things like temperature, the concentration of the reactants and the products, and then these things called catalysts. And we'll discuss these things a lot more when we get into the various pathways and chemical reactions that we'll be covering throughout the semester here. All right, so now our third type of bond to discuss is this hydrogen bond. So water has that, <coughs> excuse me, water has that covalent bond. And remember, it's a polar covalent bond between the hydrogen and the mm -hmm. oxygen in the water. But that hydrogen has that slight positive charge which causes it to be attracted to that oxygen. That hydrogen's attracted to that oxygen. That hydrogen's attracted to that oxygen, and so on and so on. So these attractions from this hydrogen to that oxygen is what we call a hydrogen bond. So it's the attraction between the hydrogen in one water to the oxygen in a second water. That little bond is what establishes all the properties of water. So the properties of water are what all living things depend upon for their survival. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to cut the lecture here, make sure we're good with our bonds, and write it down. Ionic, covalent, make sure you do polar and nonpolar, and hydrogen bond. Describe each of those bonds. Write it out in your notes, put a description, put an analogy, find some way to remember it. These bonds will come back. Now that we understand the hydrogen bond, the next lecture, we're going to start talking about properties of water.